But honestly, this is always should be a Sydney Prescott story. The entire Scream franchise. Like I never liked them going off and doing other because I didn't because I don't care about them. I cared about Sydney Prescott and all that stuff. So I'm glad that she's back. <laughs> well, anyway, <laughs> that's uh, my screen. For the- Hi, I'm Mike Field. I'm Mike Butler. And we're cut off from the world at an isolated hotel. That's right. It's time for Forgotten Horror 6, Fear the Darkness. You like how I did that? Each episode, we discuss a film that, for a variety of reasons, was forgotten by audiences. Maybe their parasitic twin brother was talking too loud in the theater, or they were too busy tracking down a ghost in a mansion. Or perhaps the movie just didn't catch on with an audience in its initial run because they were trapped in a cabin in the woods. We'll discuss what we love about the movie or perhaps don't love about it, but we'll always recommend you revisit it. Unless you've been turned into a zombie by that passing comet. If you survived being attacked by werewolves in the Scottish Highlands, we want to hear from you. We're on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and YouTube. Like, share, and subscribe. Our podcast is available on all platforms for your listening displeasure. Butler! Woo! What a mouthful. I wonder who wrote that. I did. I always regret when I write <laughs> these things. What's going on? Oh, nothing. You know, I just thought I'd uh, invite some of my closest friends to go to a cabin in the woods and, uh, I don't know, maybe get killed by some mutant zombies, maybe get killed by some aliens, a werewolf, a dancing ballerina. The Buckner gang. The Buckners. Right. Yeah. Gotta et him up. <laughs> You're gonna what them up? Add them up. That's what they oh, say on the thing. Oh, oh, okay. uh, then it turned out that we were actually on top of a giant government facility that was trying to sacrifice ourselves to appease the old Eldritch gods. So many layers. So many layers. That's right. We're doing the cabin in the woods for our third episode of Forgotten Horror Six: Fear the Darkness. Uh, and so let's get into the facts, and then let's get into what we thought about the film. Sounds great. Sounds like the what we do every week. Sounds like Forgotten Cinema. Cabin in the Woods is a runtime of ninety-five minutes. Rated R. Production budget of $30 million. Came out on April 13th, 2012. That was a Friday. We will discuss the release date as it moved several times for a variety of reasons. Opening weekend, it did $14.7 million. Domestic, $42 million. International, $28 million for a worldwide total of $70 million. Uh, Not not exactly a hit, Butler, but I think I made a lot back on home box office. What do you think? I agree. Oh, okay. Production company was... What's funny is production company is mutant and enemy productions, but erg, arc, <laughs> exactly. But the other production companies are MGM and United Artists, but they're uncredited. And I think, why don't I just get into it right now? This was an MGM film, uh, and it was shot in two thousand nine, right? Yeah, right. Be- it was shot before Thor. Yeah. Oh yeah, no. They there's a note here that um yeah, it was shot March to May of 2009. And there was a note here that uh Chris Hemsworth also did Red Dawn, the remake of Red Dawn, which I completely forgot he was in. Yep. The same year and then MGM went bankrupt. So they had to they, they kind of shelved it, then they tried to sell it and then Lionsgate came in and purchased this film. Um and its release date was uh let's see, what was its release date? It's a, it was slated for to release October 23rd, 2009, which is probably the best release date it would have had. Yep. Then it went back to February 5th, 2010, and then January 14th, 2011. Um, and then that's, I think, when they started to uh, pitch it for to get sold because they were initially held it back because they wanted to have it be a 3D release. They wanted to convert it to 3D, and then they just they decided not to. I think. Well, they didn't have any money. Right. Yeah. yeah. So then obviously eventually Lionsgate bought it, and then they put it out on April 13th, 2012. I think that was, I mean, I get why you put it out because it's been on the shelf for so long, but this is an October film. Should have been in October. I think that was the best time to have that. So yeah, they were probably just say, oh, we just spent money on this. Let's get it out as yeah, fast as we can. Yeah. So like I said, the distributor was Lionsgate. I don't know. I keep holding this pumpkin every episode. I gotta stop doing that. <laughs> okay. April 13th, it came out. So let's go back a week to April 6th, where you had a wide release of American Reunion. That's the third one, right? Of American Pie. 
Yeah. American Wedding is the third one, right? Is it American Reunion the fourth one? Yeah, I think yeah, Reunion is the fourth one. Okay, yeah. So that's one that we had on our trailer playlist that played like over and over with just the... Uh, the Reunion or Wedding? <laughs> yeah, uh, Reunion. <laughs> yeah, right. So that was April 6th. You had a limited release of The Hunter and the horror film ATM, which is basically somebody in an ATM getting stalked, right? That's what that is. That's one of those like... That was when those movies... We talked about this, like, uh, I think, maybe the last week before, like those movies that were like, you're trapped on the... Um, the ski lift, you're trapped. Right, in, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like that was one of those type of films. And you're like trapped in a location, like open water kind of thing. Uh, April 13th, when this film came out, you had the wide release of The Three Stooges, uh, The Raid Redemption, and Lockout, a movie that we did on our main show. Indeed. Did you even see The Three Stooges? Uh, I've seen clips, reboot? but no. Yeah, it's not good. No. <laughs> not good at all. Uh, I've April seen The Raid Redemption, and that's awesome. Exactly. Uh, the week after, uh, April 20th, you had a wide release of The Lucky One. Think Like a Man and the documentary Chimpanzee, because April 20th was the Earth Day releases. I don't know if they do those anymore or as prevalent. They were really popular uh, back then. Yeah, I don't know if they're as prevalent. Yeah. So this film was directed by Drew Goddard. It's actually his directorial debut. Excuse me. His directorial debut. Um, we actually did a movie of his, Butler, Bedtimes at El Royale. Yes, we did. In the main show. He's also done some episodes of The Good Place. He also wrote this film along with Joss Whedon. Uh, Goddard is nominated for an Oscar for writing The Martian. He's also a creator and writer, obviously, of the, of the TV show Daredevil. He's done World War Z and Cloverfield. Whedon, I think you probably know a Joss Whedon at this point. But if not, the TV show Buffy the Vampire Slayer, a Buff, uh, excuse me, a Butler favorite, uh, The Avengers. And he was nominated for an Oscar for his writing for Toy Story. Cinematographer was Peter Deming, who's done Mulholland Drive, The Menu, and Drag Me to Hell. Composer was David Julian, who's done The Prestige, Insomnia, and Memento. Uh, edited by Lisa Lasik, who's done The Avengers, Serenity, and The Circle. And it was produced by Joss Whedon, who uh, produces pretty much everything he does. Uh, he also did, he produced Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., the TV show, and uh, the movie Much Ado About Nothing, which he did. So right. it, it was basically him and like a bunch of his buddies. It's actually pretty good, but if you're interested, Much Ado About Nothing. Anyways. This film stars Kristen Connolly as Dana from The Boy, Deep Water, and the TV show Zoom, or Zoom, excuse me, with an N. Chris Hemsworth is Kurt. He's obviously from Thor, Furiosa, and the 2009 Star Trek. Uh, Anna Hutchinson as Jules from Robert the Bruce, Vengeance, A Love Story, and Love and Coffee. Fran Kranz as Marty from uh, Mass. Mass, actually, he directed um, The Village and the TV show Dollhouse. Jesse Williams as Holden from the TV shows Grey's Anatomy and Only Murders in the Building season three. I think he was last season. Uh, and then you had Richard Jenkins as Sitterson and Bradley Whitford as Hadley. The two, um, they're supposed to represent the writers, I guess. Joss Whedon said in an interview, like they're supposed to be him and, yeah. and Goddard. Uh, Jenkins is nominated for an Oscar for The Visitor and The Shape of Water. And he's also in Step Brothers. And uh, Whitford has been in Get Out, Saving Mr. Banks. And of course, the TV show The West Wing, Josh Lyman. Uh, Brian White as Truman from the Family Stone, Stomp the Yard, and TV show Ambitions. Uh, Truman is the guard, the uh, the new guard that's working in there uh, with them. Control, yeah, making yeah. sure the control rooms they safe. Yep. yep. For jo uh, for Joss Whedon fans, you had Amy Acker as Lynn from the TV show Angel and Person of Interest. Uh, Tom Lenk, another uh, Joss Whedon uh, specialty from the Buffy the Vampire Slayer TV show. He's yep. in a couple episodes there. He plays Ronald the Intern. And then you had a couple of people you might have recognized. So Gordy Weaver's in there. Uh, Tim Desarn as Mordecai, who's the uh, gas station owner. I'm still on speakerphone, aren't I? <laughs> yeah. So he, you, you, if you've seen him, you probably saw him in a lot of horror films because that's kind of like where he... His thing, you know, yeah. Exactly. He's got that look. <laughs> exactly. Right. Okay, Butler. Um, did we see this movie together? I don't remember. I think I saw it twice in theaters, but I don't know if I screened it for myself and then brought Elise to it or if we watched it. I'm not sure. I can't remember when I saw this film. I want to say I saw it in theaters, but I just don't remember. All right. I remember it. I just don't remember <laughs> when I saw it. I've seen it a few times. I've seen it at least twice in theaters, and I think I've seen it twice on my Blu-ray. I'm going to venture a guess that you really like to love this film, like really like slash love this film. Yes. Okay. I think there's a lot going for it. There's a lot I like. It's the kind of horror I like that Cabin in the Woods, anything. It's literally an anything goes movie. Like mm -hmm. that's what they set up. I like that it plays on horror films uh, and tropes and they talk about it and they joke about it. Um, I like the look of it. I do think it's a little too clean looking um, when they're in the cabin. Okay. I do think it looks too much like a set at times, uh, but it, it technically is well, the, cabin the government made that, that these, True. these people made. So, I guess that works. It also could just be it's a very digitally kind of made film. 
Uh, the cabin also looks like uh, a TARDIS bigger on the inside when they come up to it. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. that's like the Evil Dead cabin. Yes, it's way bigger, yep. too. Yep. Inside, yeah. Yep. But yeah, I, I really, really like this film. I think most of the jokes really work for me. I, I, it moves pretty quick. I mean, it's only an hour and a half or an hour and 37 or something. Oh, like uh, yeah. Like 90, I said like 95 minutes, yeah. right? Yeah. 95 minutes. So I, I, it really works for me. I love the end. Um, the, the whole ending. You're talking the about. whole ending. Yeah. yeah. I just, I, I really do enjoy that. I, I love the fact that every time you watch it, you find new, new monsters that you didn't see before. Okay. So, so what, yeah. what, what were the new monsters you, you discovered in this one? Um, I, I didn't realize that there the spot, were, sorry. um, Creatures from the Left 4 Dead series, which I didn't know until I read the notes. I went back and I was like, oh, yeah, look at the bloater and the witch and stuff like that. Uh, there's sexy witches, I guess, which you're, are from Buffy. You're talking about the, uh, the video game. Yes, in the video oh. game Left 4 Dead. Uh, so there's just a lot of like little things that you notice. Um, you know, there's just dogs. One of the things is just dogs. One of the, the boxes is a giant kitten. There's just a lot of weird little things to like just pick up on and just just see uh, throughout the movie. OK, uh, that I, I really I really enjoy. And I, I, like I said, I love the way it plays with the tropes. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, that's it. That's it. For show. <laughs> I'm waiting for you to give me the, oh, I assume you hate this film kind of vibe. You know, you hate when I say that. So I was going to, and I was like, I'll just wait for him to say, <laughs> meh. <No. laughs> um, uh, I think there's, there's obviously a lot of. And I don't ever assume you hate films. Yes, you I assume you meh. No, all the films that I films. like. <laughs> um, do you remember when we did Red Rock West and we talked about the lighting and we talked about how the lighting made it feel like a TV show? Like I would sure. Just, yeah. I got that same sense here with the CGI and with just and maybe because I also watch Buffy and I also watch Angel and I am very familiar with Joss Whedon and, and all that all that TV work that I just right. there's all there's there's not all scenes just very every once and again something pops up and happens and i'm just like it felt very tv showish and that's not a negative that's just kind of the sense i got especially with the cgi when they show all the boxes which is a really cool scene when they pull back all the boxes and you see everything and yes i get it they didn't have enough money this is what they're they're wor we're working with yeah, the guy. Get a little budget yeah but it felt like a little bit like a TV kind of budget kind of thing with the CG. It felt really like really fake. Well, everybody felt copy pasted into their box. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, and we talked about this with past movies here and, and other films in the show, the digital blood, like this is almost like the first advent of the digital blood because it's very, like it's not as good as it is now, even though it is still digital sure. blood gunshots and stuff like that. But they use a lot of real no, blood too as well. Well, when in the, uh, what well, I'm talking about, I'm not talking about when the set is dressed. I'm more talking about when you see like, when the creatures come out and they just start all attacking, like that's a lot of that's digital. Okay. That's all I'm saying. I, I just get a very uh, TV show adjacent kind of vibes in some instances, not the entire film It's very cinematic and it's very, and all that stuff. So I don't know. I, I, I wasn't really necessarily negative. I just kept thinking about, you know, Oh, Buffy. Oh, wait. I just kept thinking about that stuff. I don't know if you ever felt that or not that not in a negative I, way, just kind of like you kind of like, I almost wonder if that's, what I'm saying about how it looks too clean, too digital. Maybe, maybe. I think we're both kind of coming at the same same thing about the look. Okay. From the same thing, but you're saying a little different. Right. But I think, yeah. I mean, I didn't get the TV look. I just felt like it felt like a lot of movies did back then um, when they were first coming. Like super digital, super cleaned up, super, which makes things look a little too fake, makes things look a little too unrealistic or too dressed. And, and like you said, the lighting as well. Like, But like I said, it, it is a set. But like, there's a lot of stuff like the cabin is just so well lit, even though it's like two lamps lighting the whole thing. Sure. And, and the outside of the cabin is so beautifully lit by moonlight with this dark blue nighttime that doesn't actually exist. And, it, and to be fair, it is supposed to be fabricated because they are controlling uh, Sitterson and Hadley down below are controlling like the mood and the light. And the whole, and the yeah. Stuff. Even so, Marty looks yeah. up and goes, aren't there supposed to be stars? Yeah, so, yeah, so, I there, mean, there is that kind of like manufactured look. But it almost it's almost like an excuse to have the movie look the way it is, which is fine. Mm -hmm. It's better than just making the movie look like that and just calling it a day. Cabin is very boring. I know it's 2012 shot in 2009. There's no TV. There's no internet. Like if I went there, I would not be excited. Well, it's no distractions. If if you have TV, they'd probably be like, "Come on, go to the basement," and everyone's just, just watching very, TV. It's just like, very Come boring. On. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why don't we talk about the the characters, not the actors, but the characters? I know that they play up on their tropes because I know that, and I guess we can talk about the suspension of disbelief here in terms of like how far ahead they planned this. 
this whole group to get this group together to play up the tropes of the fool and and um what the jock the fool the jock or the fool the warrior the virgin and the uh scholar and we'll oh still, and the and the whore yeah so they chemically induce them to be that way so like when they talk about how the hair dye in uh, Jules, uh, Jules, Jules, Jules is has su- the hair dry- It's supposed to kind of turn her into somebody who is horny and somebody who is horny you know, and decreases he, intelligence. Yeah, I, I, they don't really explain. They, they talk about the fool. They talk about with Marty that they had to. They laced his weed, right? But not his special stash. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, but I guess like yeah, he, he just it didn't affect him. But they didn't really. How do they do? Uh, like the Hemsworth character, I don't remember his name. Kurt and Dana. How did and Kurt? Yeah, and Dana. And, and how did they get them? How did they? They, they don't, don't really. Say, they don't really right? say. Yeah. Okay, so I thought I might have missed it. Yeah. Because like, because Kurt is fine until he shows up, and then all of a sudden he's like, "Hey, man, Jack, this guy." And I know, like, Marty even says, "Like, what's he talking about? He never acts he's like that." He's not like this. He's a sociology major. Right. Blah, blah. I mean, I assume with Dana, they make her make that teacher break up with her so that she's alone. Maybe so she becomes a virgin. Yeah. Um, but they don't really need to work on her that much. Right. She's already shy. And then, yeah, but with Holden and Kurt, they don't really talk about anything. Right. Right. So they set this up and, and they kind of, they play off the tropes, but, and Goddard has a, a, a comment, a quote from this, let he was talking about the scene where Hemsworth talks to them before he jumps the, uh, gorge. Mm-hmm. And he was like, he's like at that, I knew he was going to be a movie star during that scene. Like, okay, that's great. Well, um, I mean, yeah. that's how he got cast in red Dawn as well. True. Even though yeah. it was supposed to come out the same year. They saw the dailies for that speech and they were like, well, he's the guy to, he's yeah. the guy to lead the sure. resistance against the Soviets of or whatever. Course, yeah. Of course. Um, so, but I'm curious, like what you thought of, of, Let's talk. Let's take the 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 group of five. Let's take the kid, the, the kids the in the cabin. Kids cabin. Yeah. What did you think about them? I I loved them. I thought right. they they played their tropes really well. There's an excuse to have the tropes, um, uh, and it just follows traditional horror movie rules on on purpose to make you to explain away their story. Like this is why things happen. This is why Evil Dead exists. This is why Scream exists. This is why you know any horror movie you can think of as the setup to these guys having done it. And why they're so stereotypical and all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I think it, I think it works. That works really, really well. I mean, they go overboard like Jules where her, she's dancing and then she makes out with the wolf. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, yeah, when you realize, yes, it is kind of weird. Yeah. But, and I guess in that scene, they put confectionery sugar or powder on the tongue. So on the tongue so it looks dusty and it's not gross, but it's still. But my first thought is like, I don't know any head on a wall of an animal that has a tongue that can move. I was, I was thinking yeah. the same thing. It was like a movable tongue. Yeah. He's got such a weird expression. Like, why would you have that expression on your mounted wolf head? Yeah. Like, yeah. So what about what about the characters down below? What about like Sitterson, Hadley and all the people that are working down there? What did you think of that whole? I like Sitterson and Hadley because I like that they're jokey. But then when stuff like when it starts to hit the fan, they are sad. They they don't they're not happy about it. like when the first kill happens, they go from being jokey to being like. Yep. Like they, when they, Jules they gets got. Prayer. Yeah. And then they say the prayer, which I wrote down. I like the prayer. This we offer in humility and fear for your eternal slumber as it ever was. Sure. I think that's cool. And that, but they also like regret what they do is like they're jokey and stuff because they have the worst job in the world. Their job is to kill five kids every year. Right. Um. So I really like the way they go about it. I, I do get the writers. Right. Um. Like how they're supposed example, to Example, be because they're creating the the events that are unfolding and talking about it and mocking it and explaining why it has to be. I don't know if I like Lynn, Amy Acker's character, though. Okay. She's just like, this is your job. Why you're like, you're so regrettable about the job and you're like trying to explain it away to this guard. But if you know you're saving the world, then you're saving the world. Or if you don't like the job, I don't understand why she's there necessarily. There's uh, really no redeemable characters in down there. Uh, in the lower, like that's why they all have to go, right? I think because even she makes the bet. I mean, as, and as soon as she makes the bet, you know that she has to go. Yeah, she's not. She's not different then, but I'm surprised that they let that they had um, Truman go, the guard, or the the officer, the military guy. Right. But so I was surprised there. The answer to this question, I believe, is budgetary reasons. But I didn't understand why there's two guys that were only in charge of all. Like they were in the room. They're in the. They, they had everyone in there. Like, eh, hey, celebrating. But like you would think like something like this big would have a giant control room center and you would have, hey, what do we got on light? Like, you, you know, like kind of like you're in NASA 
Oh, it is a pretty big control room. But they don't have anybody in there. True. I mean, and they're expecting you know, the explosive guys to be doing their stuff and the other guys, but they're locked in. That's why the guard is there. No one can come in or out during this time. I think it's to make sure that, you know, Citizen and Hadley are the guys. They know that they're going to kill these kids. They don't want anyone in there. And Lynn's in there, too. But everyone else knows. But they don't want anyone in here who might interfere with it. The more people you have in there, the more likely it is that you might have someone who decides, you know, this isn't right. We got to sure. we got to stop it. So I think it's a, a situation where we need to make sure these kids die to save the world. And so lock them with the guard. This is your job. Right. But also budget. <laughs> but it's not like like you said, it's not like they didn't have the extras. Right. What is the connection with the creatures in the boxes and the old gods down below? those creatures in the boxes have to kill these kids in order for them to be appeased down below or do these kids just have to die because it, it which is it i don't know exactly uh because they make it see i think i think it's supposed to be those monsters or it's supposed to be because of the situation that's going on sure but after you know, marty gets out and after it's like too they're, late they're like just kill him then sigourney weaver's character the director is just like kill him just kill him right. at least we can just get it done because at this point we have no other choice. Right. Right. Okay. So I was curious, like what the connection was. That's what I figured. Like even if Jewel, uh, even if Dana or the director killed Marty, it probably wouldn't have worked. Okay. Because I do think it has to be, because I think these creatures, you're assuming these creatures are kind of like creatures of the old gods or something right. like that. So the fact that now I know it's a horror film. So horror films sometimes end on a down note. But the fact that your heroine and your hero, Marty and Dana, Dana, uh, decide not to save the world and save themselves and just oh, maybe give someone else a shot. Like they don't like doesn't that make them bad guys? Oh, yeah. OK, there's no redeemable good guys. Yeah. Marty's greedy. He doesn't want to die, even though it will save the world. Dana's dead. You know, she's got bit by that werewolf. She's yeah. Bleeding from her juggler vein. Yeah. And, and plus, Marty had been stabbed a bajillion times. Where are they going? It's just it's. It's pointless. You could have saved the world, but you chose not to. Mm -hmm. It's like, I get that it sucks. And I get that the sacrificing of everybody sucks, but the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few kind of a thing. <laughs> well, it's just, it's right. just like at the end, it's just like kind of greedy, bro. Yeah. I think that's probably, I guess the writer in me and the storyteller in me, cause you can't root for them. Cause at the end of the film, like you're rooting for them. But then at the end of the film, they're just kind of like, eh, and you're like, Oh, what? Yeah. Like we're just find a way to save the world. Yeah. Yeah. So like, there's nobody like I want. So when you, upon repeat watch, you're just like, these people are all, they can just all go. Yeah. You, you don't know, feel it, bad. Yeah. For them. Yeah. And I, I mean, I mean, there is that question, like, do you need in a horror film to, have like should there be somebody within that film that an audience can relate to as the quote unquote protagonist or a good guy or protagonist do you need that in i don't think you do because there's so many movies where or horror movies where you get you get a character who who still even if it's the smallest thing they still do something wrong that causes the event sure look at um i know what you did last summer you know mm -hmm. they're all partly responsible for what happens and but but there's still you still root for Jennifer Love Hewitt's character. Exactly. Yeah, you still root, to, but she still did something wrong. You're correct. She's um, part of it. Hellraiser is kind of the same Open way. In the box. Yeah. Somebody always opens the box. Someone's always too curious about but I, the now, sexuality or me, the puzzle. Horror movie fans out there, and my friends who are horror movie fans, I don't know. Isn't there always somebody that is accidentally opens the box on per like if they're caught up into it? Isn't that? It's like, a puzzle box. So yeah. I mean, some people don't know what they're opening right. or are forced to open right. it. But somebody always opens it and it's a creepy, but it's, you know what you're doing. But bro. I know his name's not Pinhead. I just want to say that. I know we've called, I know people call that, but that's not his name. That's just his show. name. Yeah, yeah. His name is something else, which I, I don't, that. Re I which I that. don't remember what his name is. I'm not a huge Hellraiser guy. Really? Like, not to say I'm not a huge, I like the first one. I've just haven't seen all of them. Do you not like Clive Barker? It came out of a No, I like yeah, Clive Barker. Yeah. I do, there, I do want to go back and, and watch all the Hellraisers, but right now I'm, I'm only on Hellraiser one and I know stuff that happens. Also known as Hellraiser. So I just want to throw <laughs> you always <laughs> you always want to throw one in front of those movies to make oh, the first hell hey, All right. So we're we're talking about plot a little bit. I want to talk about uh, the scene in the beginning when they drive through the tunnel and they go out and then you see the eagle and the eagle slams into the wall. And you're like, oh, shield. my God. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a that's a cool moment. That's a nice little thing like, ooh, what the heck is this? What's going on there? But does that take away from the scene where Hemsworth jumps the or Kurt jumps the bike? Because you know what's going to happen. Oh, no, like, I. Love that. I was like cracking up when I but brought Elisa. Okay. But like my question is like, don't you, because you know what's going to happen, doesn't that kind of eliminate the, 
factor of when it happens, you're like, you get, sh- I think you get okay. shocked. I still think it's shocking because you think he's kind of like your main. He's your he's your warrior. He's your hero guy, especially because this movie ended up coming out after Thor. So you're watching this and it's like, ah, oh, it's Chris Hemsworth. He's going to be okay. fine. And, and plus the eagle thing happens way before. And I think at that point, at least for me, I'm so caught up in everything else that you happened about it. that I forget about it. And then I'm like, oh, that's right. Plus the fact that he just keeps hitting the shield every time like he just keeps oh, the way boom down. boom doing all the way down it's that's probably like, to show you how good. far down it goes it's too. also funny yeah <laughs> it is all right <laughs> when i was watching the movie and they talked about the other rituals that failed i was like well what are these rituals i want to know and then i went back to the notes did you know what did you know that they represent different things did you know that did you see that well, note yeah you can kind of see it on the screen well, when you see the failed you things. obviously the japan one the kyoto one is obviously the ring it's ringu yeah, That's like the ghost, there. the spirit ghost. But the Buenos Aires one is supposed to be King Kong. Yeah, because you see the dead monkey on the ground. Okay, I didn't see that. Was... Oh, and the so the first shot they show for Buenos Aires is just a destroyed city. Okay. When they finally show all the cleanup, it, in the rubble, you can see the dead uh, uh, King Kong. I didn't see that. Okay. Stock... It's a quick, like, flashing miss it. Stockholm is supposed to be the thing. Which I didn't get. I yeah. have to go back and try to look at the Stockholm. And Madrid TV. is supposed to be Dracula? Apparently. Yeah, okay. The so... only ones I got were Buenos Aires and obviously Japan is okay. the ring. Because Japan has got a perfect record. <laughs> Not anymore. And I love but when, look, Kiko got became a frog. So yeah, they, they sing a they sing a happy song and it becomes a frog. But not for nothing. But oh, what's yeah. that? What's Kiko doing uh that whole time? Just the like kill All kids. The kids are alive. Like, like I mean, like what are we doing? Wait, what are you doing here? Seven days. I don't know. <laughs> uh, the the no, the comment when they talk about it, they haven't had a problem since ninety eight, and that I, I'm curious. Like, does that reference something specific in the notes? It was like in ninety eight, H two O came out. And they were like, uh, they 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 stopped him. Oh, because Jamie yeah. Lee Curtis actually I, kills him. I'm in that not one. buying that. That's someone's gonna have to tell. Like Josh Whedon's gonna have to be like, yes, that's what we mean for me to believe that. I mean, that's funny because then that connects. If they are saying that, then that means all those movies, all horror movies, are part of. I think that's what the they're saying. Things, yeah, which is cool. But yeah, like you said, somebody's got to actually say that. I think what it means is, you know, sometimes the old gods get out, and maybe there is a way to put them back in the box. Right. Maybe there is a way. I mean, at at some point. You know, it looks like the old gods are out. Oh, they're going to destroy the world. But at some point, humanity was able to put them back down there and create this sacrifice thing to appease them. Mm-hmm. So at some point, you know, we did defeat the old gods. So maybe they are beatable. Mate, well, when they, he at the end of the film, you see the giant hand come out. I Which can't is supposed to be why. the fire god Titan or right. whatever. But I mean, I would assume the shield's still up, right? <laughs> so I would assume that big hand could take it down. Well, maybe the shield's not still up because the facility under underneath got this power though didn't maybe lose power lost, maybe it lost power i mean maybe the uh the guys down there the the guy that's supposed to, supposed to be uh the cenobite is supposed to be looking like uh the oh, hellraiser people buzz, that, buzzsaw head yeah, or whatever, whatever they're yeah. um you know i i think I, for the sake of the plot i mean dana pretty much figures it out really quickly when she sees the ball i mean it's a little too fast but i get it i mean you know i, I you, we you kind of want it. Yeah, exactly yeah you kind of want that because you just want to know other other than that, you'd have to have her go and um, Stillman and or Citizen and Holden would have to be like, is it Holden? Find I'm it. sorry, what I've been saying his name. No, no, was? Citizen and Hadley. I'm sorry, okay. Citizen and Hadley would have to be like, all right, here's what happened, and yeah. she'd have to like meet up with them for them to explain it. Right, right. But we've already, we as the audience have already had it explained to us. Right, Father. Do you know what the connection between this film and Nightmare on Elm Street is? The one of the makeup artists was the final girl from the final girl, the final girl, the final girl. So the well, she Heather Loggenkamp, for those who are a big fans of Nightmare on Elm Street, was who was the original. Um, as he said, it was Nancy from Nightmare Nancy, on Elm Street. Nancy, uh, her husband is a special effects artist, so he worked on the sh- on the on the movie and she helped him. And so she was on the set working on this. So I think it's a, a little cool kind of behind the scenes thing. So, yeah. I'm sure she was popular on set. People probably. Oh, like, oh no, my god! It's she's Nancy, yeah. horror, horror like um royalty. Channel? Yes, horror. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely yep. horror royalty. I mean, I remember when they did the new Nightmare. And she it was like a big thing that she was she back. Came so, back. Yeah, no, totally. That's great. I mean, I thought that was a little. Like, Even though she yeah, dies yeah. at the end of the first one, maybe. Whoa! Did they have explained that in that one when she comes back? Uh, I don't I remember. I have to go back and watch Nightmare it. Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, I haven't knowledge. watched it in a long time. I think I was kind of starting to watch them when the the remake came out with um who played him. Oh, guy from Watchmen. Yeah. Jackie Earl Haley. Jackie Earl Haley. I knew that. <laughs> we didn't edit. 
But yeah, I, I I don't remember. I know she came back, but I don't remember if they explain what happened when she gets. This is that we're talking about Nancy now. From that we're talking about Nancy. We're no longer talking about the Captain of the Woods. Well, we're we're done with Captain. <laughs> <laughs> this is a Nightmare on Elm Street podcast. Now we're talking about horror films. <laughs> that would be a good. Not like uh, I don't want to get on a tangent, but that would be a good. Not lead up, but kind of like a retro look back kind of series where we watch some of the older films. I know other podcasts that have done that before, but that might be something we could do. I mean, if October doesn't have anything, we can do lead ups. Well, we do have to, have to do a Patreon exclusive during October. All right. Well, so we, we could we could do that. We don't need to talk about it on the podcast. I don't know why I brought <laughs> it up. I apologize. I apologize. Um, there was something else I wanted to talk about. Oh, the scene where they're celebrating, they're having the party in the control room, and in the back room background, you see the images. You see Dana fighting with uh, whatever the one. Oh, the, the party music dies. plays. Yeah. Yep. I to be honest, they kept they kept talking about in the notes like. The woman who played the Buckner mother with this. And I go, I don't know who's who. I can't tell who, what's going on. I mean, I can tell who the little girl is. Yeah, because she's, she's got little, no arm and right? she's a little girl. Yeah. And the other two, I'm just like, all right. So the scene where she's getting like that took forever. And there was one part where she's like completely vomits blood everywhere. And I'm like, uh, what, is, what is going on? The back blood vomits like gross, but also how how is she still alive? What is happening? Yeah. yeah. And then they come back to it and the doc's fine. And it's just the same. And like this thing's just been throwing her around left and right. I'm like, this is taking forever. As long as she suffers. <laughs> That's true. Do they know that? Do the, do the Buckners and the, the creatures know they have to kill in certain order? Oh, no. I think that's that the uh, the guys in the control room are just very carefully directing okay. them to make sure that they're killing the right people in the okay. right order. The Buckner's whole thing is pain. Right. So it makes sense that, you know, if they can torture her, they'd torture her instead of kill her. Mm -hmm. As the last one left, they don't have to hunt anybody down. So. Mm -hmm. He's gonna play with her a little bit. Okay. All right. That that's fair. That's that's a good point. Does it? I only got that this time because I always wondered the same thing. But when I was because I've watched this now so many times, when she's reading the book, they do explain how pain is like their entry to God or something like that. Right. Yeah. Right. I, I know that this is not this is a trope, and I know that it's in here the tilted head thing when the Buckner tilts his head. He's like this, and oh, it's it. a classic it's in, monster thing. It's in there thing, from yeah. Mike Myers. I understand that. I'm sick and tired of saying it. Like it's exactly it's like an, it, enough already, but I get it. It's never going to go away, but it's just like it's not scary. Like, I feel like in a horror movie, like I need in Scream 7 when it comes out, someone to do that. And they're like, That's, what are you doing? Like, I need somebody to reference it in the movie because <laughs> at this point, I'm just because any movie that references, I will like it forever because at this point, I'm just like, I'm so tired of it. Like, I feel like I, I always think about when these guys are planning that oh, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to hunt them down, but then I'm going to tilt my head real like, like this, like, like to scare them even like, I really think like, I want that scene in a movie, like them explaining why they're tilting their head. I can't stand it anymore. I'm tired it's like, it. now that you're saying that it's not even just a trope in horror movies. Cause I think you get like martial arts movies and stuff and they're like, yeah, like the head tilt is just like the bring it, bring it on kind yeah. of emotion. Yeah. And, it, and you know, listen, um, if I'm watching the matrix and I'm watching a show that like, and I'm watching the first hour and a half of a martial arts film or any film, not just the matrix, but anything that's awesome. And that happens. I'm like, yeah, but like that has to be earned almost. And like when it's just in there and I'm just, what am I supposed to be like? Oh, oh man, it's tilting the head. Oh, I don't, I don't care anymore. I'm old. I don't care. <laughs> Stop tilting the head. But I know this film is 10 years old, 12 years old. It's, it's also ripping on tropes. So I can't really, you know, be a jerk like that so i but yeah here you are being a jerk. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to be i'm, I'm speaking my truth <laughs> manifesting all that good stuff all right let's get to some uh let's get to some reviews hit me with them. and i knew you'd like this film so, so you only got, get the bad i ones. got the bad ones lisa schwartzbaum of entertainment weekly a close friend of yours i'm sure quote, <laughs> quote the mo i didn't even do the grade quote the movie's biggest surprise may be that the story we think we know from modern scary cinema that horror is a fun Cosmic game, not much else. Here turns out to be pretty much the whole enchilada. She was not feeling it. Yeah, but that's the point of the point of the movie. She was not feeling it, brother. No, she sucks. David Rooney <laughs> of the Hollywood Reporter quote: "It's just too bad the movie is never much more than a hollow exercise in self-reflexive cleverness that not nearly as ingenious to see it seems to think." I think that's a common uh, uh, critique of Joss Whedon's writing. Of Joss Whedon's work, because that that's how he is. That he's not as clever as he thinks. Well, he I think because it, it is clever, and on. I think people are like, "Oh, you're just so like." I think they don't like that, and it, sometimes it works really well, and sometimes, yeah, if you've seen it enough, you're like, "Ah, eh, Joss Whedon." You know, I think this was really well. Dave Rooney doesn't agree. Well, he sucks too. <laughs> Ao Scott, Ao of New York <laughs> Times quote. 
novelty and genre traditionalism, excuse me, traditionalism, wow, often fight to a draw. Too much overt cleverness, there we go again, has a way of spoiling dumb, reliable thrills. And despite the evident ingenuity and strenuous labor that went into it, the cabin in the woods does not quite work. End quote. He sucks too. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> no, I want a better response to than he sucks. Uh, everybody's response is the same. It's like, ah, oh, it's clever. That's the whole movie. That's the whole freaking movie. If you want a, a Cabin in the Woods movie that's a horror movie, watch The Evil Dead. It's the perfect Cabin in the Woods movie. Mm-hmm. Or Cabin Fever. It's also very good. I don't know. Perfect, but it's very good. Cabin Fever? Cabin Fever. I've never seen it. Oh, really? It was one of those films that I just never got to. And then I was just like, oh, I forgot that. Oh, well. It's I, on. It's on the list. I just haven't. Was it at the same time as this? Because I think I always combine them. There's two, two cabin fevers. Oh, There's the original, and then they remade it. Like, I don't know. I never saw the remake. I don't know why they remade it because it wasn't that old. To be so wait with. a minute. Eli Roth remade it, or yes. someone remade Eli Roth, or he I don't, remade himself. He remade him. I don't know if he directed it, but okay. he was part of it. But the original was, Cabin in the Woods is not bad. Okay. It's definitely worth watching. It's on the list. The original Cabin Fever, not Cabin. Yeah, in the, Woods. the original See, exactly. Cabin Fever. Exactly. Two to cabins. Knock in the cab, knock in the cabin or something like that. All right. I want to do one more quote. This one's from Joss Whedon. He talks about the film. He he describes the film as an attempt to revitalize the horror genre. That's what him and I know that's. Oh, that's a thing. douchey quote. Okay. Uh, him and hold on. I'm not, I'm not even at the quote yet. Uh, like that's what him and Drew got it. Like they wanted to re, re- chain. They were tired of the torture porn stuff. Oh, well, um, yeah. He called it a loving hate letter to the, the genre. And he goes. Quote, it's a serious critique of what we love and what we don't about horror movies. I love being scared. I love that mixture of thrill of horror, that objectification slash identification thing of wanting definitely for the people to be all right. But at the same time, hoping they'll go somewhere dark and face something awful. The things that I don't like are kids acting like idiots. The devolute, the devil, excuse me, the devolution, 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 oh, spelled wrong, devolution. <laughs> The de-evolution of the horror movie that into torture porn and into a long series of sadistic comeuppances, Drew and I both felt that the pendulum had swung a little too far in that direction. Well, they are not wrong about that. That was absolutely where everything was going. And still kind of is. This quote is kind of a little nose in the air kind of quote. Like, I, I agree with you. A little, little douching. A little, 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 little sense of douchiness right there. I don't disagree with it, but yeah, like, we're going to save the, the, we're going to save horror. Yeah. It's kind of like, Slow your roll. Tell a story. It takes it takes a lot. Tell a story. Like just don't. Yeah. If you're if you're doing this movie because you're trying to make a statement about the genre that you don't live in, that you really don't like, you don't write. I mean, he wrote Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but that's it's a comedy, of the movie. I mean, it's a horror, but it's not like even the the TV show is more actiony than it is horror. Sure. Um, it plays in the tropes, but yeah, it's not really horror, horror. But tell a story, because then when you start putting the message before the story, then it's gonna, it's not, you're not gonna achieve what you need to achieve. I think they tell a story here. I never, what his quote is, I never got that from watching this movie. I never got like, oh, they're trying to change it up. It was a refreshing horror movie, gonna change it because in the early 2000s up to like the 2010s, that was everything you got it was a torture porn movie. It's just everything was hostile or Eli Roth and saw and just trying to one up the grossness and and that doesn't make for a good horror movie because it's like at some point you become desensitized well that's to a it. different horror type of type sure of but film. that like what they're saying like it's the takeover so and, and the tropes of like well, everyone being so dumb you know it, playing with i get i get what they're saying i just every, don't get that hero in, part of the quote. in every genre there is a subgenre that hits and then you start having more show like 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 the hereditary the gross, movies the, the, and right well, the, the creepiness like you're talking about or like yeah the, the ari aster stuff um w- you know with hereditary and then with um midsummer midsummer and stuff like that i mean i'm not watching the four-hour version um and then like with comedy you like not like gross out comedy like when dumb and dumber hit and then you had a bunch of gross outs or like even back in the day when you had porkies and all that stuff and then those type of you know, the sex one, teenager ones yeah out. and then when american pie hit in 99 and then all of a sudden you had road trip and you had all those other you know sex comedies come out like sex drive and all that stuff so um it, it, sometimes in a, in a genre a subgenre comes through and then it pops out i, I mean you. i always talked about with horror that i grew up on um slasher, slasher film yeah so yeah no so i will always love a slasher film if it if it's what i'm explaining I'll like part scary but part fun um sure people i can root for i think that's probably why i'm a little bit disconnect here in terms of like there's nobody good to root for here because they you know they're just selfish at the end and that's fine i get what you're doing there but yeah so i just think i mean i don't know if if, if he needs to revitalize the horror that's genre. the thing it's like i agree with the quote but like the fact that it's like 
we decided we were the heroes yeah. this place needed. It's like it takes time. Like like we even talked with Ari Aster and his like with Hereditary and Midsummer. Now you get a bunch of those kind of the witch, super long winded. Yeah. yeah, well, the witch is good too. But no, no, no I'm just but saying. Yeah, I'm saying. No, I get you. Films, yeah. But I don't really. Well, okay, you should give me one that you don't like. Then how about that? I, that's the thing. Is like I, I I don't really like Midsummer. I think Midsummer is way too long and a little pompous. I do. Hereditary is very good, and the witch is pretty good. But the thing is, like they're exhausting. They're very long. They're very heady. And you're depressed. Like, you get, you you're depressed at the end. It's like, yeah. they're like novels that are like on page, which is cool, but also like, <laughs> well, you would like Abigail. That's new. You'd like that. I do want to watch Abigail. I hear Abigail's fun. The black phone was cool. The black phone is good. Yeah. Like, I yep. think at the moment, I think horror is still trying to find what the next subgenre that everyone's going to follow is. I think we're leaning more into that hereditary stuff, but it's not necessarily stuck there. Uh, I would like to see, obviously, like you said, Mon uh, Abigail, like monster movies making a comeback. When we're recording this, Alien Romulus is about to come out. And obviously that's got a lot of mm -hmm. alien movies are monster horror, but also kind of body horror in a different kind of way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I don't know. I'm not a huge torture porn guy, so I kind of like that Cabin in the Woods kind of upset that balance. Mm -hmm. And obviously I always talk about how much I love the Evil Dead franchise. Uh, even Fede Alvarez's movie. I'm not a huge Rise guy. Um, Evil Dead Rise. Oh, I was a little disappointed in that, but the other ones are all really, really good. So, you know, I'm a sucker for that cabin in the woods kind of genre anyway. So I love that this movie played with it. Uh, so why are, who would you recommend this to? I really like this movie. I, I think so. I haven't met anyone who doesn't like this movie. I'm assuming you aren't met on it. I think you kind of enjoyed it I because think, usually I, I can I, tell from your tone. Do you not listen to me when we're talking about the film? <laughs> usually I can tell from your tone if you're like, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh, he didn't like it. He just doesn't want to say it. Uh, but yeah, I, I haven't met anyone who like actively doesn't like this film. So I think I think you have to like horror uh, enough to like appreciate those tropes and and really enjoy what's going on in the control room. Otherwise, you're going to find the control room kind of annoying and contrived. Um, I think that you have to enjoy horror comedies as well, in a way. And you have to be into that kind of horror that's not torture. If you're only like Saw and uh, oh, like or, Hostel or the or uh, the Terrifier. Oh, yeah. The Terrifier yeah. movies. You're not going to like this one. It's not. It's not that kind of horror for you. Right. But I think if you like other horror, like monster movies, like Cabin in the Woods movies, I think even if you like, like slashers, a casual like, horror film, like I think a casual horror film. It, yeah. If you're uh, not like enthusiast. super into horror, or you're like, just like, yeah, all or like that. a date night movie where you're coming over, someone's coming over and you want, what movie should we watch? I want to show or something yeah. that's fun, but scary. Like this is that it's this like a safe, a one, it's yeah. almost like a safe horror film. You know what I mean? Yeah. You have yeah. to have an appreciation, but not be like super and, into it. Where you're just like, and I, and listen, uh, hardcore horror fans, I get it. You know, it's not what you want, but there these type of horror films are the kind of almost like the gateway to true horror films. Like these are the type of horror films that you show people that maybe I like horror, but I'm always scared. I'm like, well, we'll let's watch this. If you like this, then I'll show you some stuff after that. Like the, it's almost like that kind of. That's kind of how I got into horror films, because I used to, you know, I loved X-Files growing up. Mm -hmm. um, watched that at way too young an age uh, and obviously Aliens and Evil Dead. And that kind of brought me into Evil Dead, brought me into the nightmare on elm street movies because freddie has a sense of humor as well and then from freddie it when i went to friday the 13th and from there i just kind of started to explore the genre yeah when you're younger for a lot of people like it, it's so they're scary because they're like oh my god is this real like that's you really believe in that but then there comes a point when you get to an age however it is for different people however they mature where you're just like no this is all bs like this and and then you start having fun and you start enjoying right. it and you start getting and you enjoy the fact of get being scared or you enjoy the fact of like what's going to happen um i mean i don't sit there when uh in certain movies when there's like a, a gory scene um i'm not like oh i'm usually laughing or i'm just usually like come on like or i'm thinking like how did they do this Cause yeah some of them are just yeah, really impressive yeah. yeah so but yeah i think so why then why are we saying it's forgotten if 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 you like it and it's it, you know well why don't I always go first. Why don't you go first this time? Oh, man. Why is it forgotten? I don't know. I always ask you the question. Um, <laughs> I think that it's maybe for the exact reasons I said in terms of it being a gateway to horror. I think that and what you were talking about with horror films, I think some people might probably stayed away from it. I think April was a terrible time to put it yeah, out. April's a weird time. I don't, I, I don't think anybody is into a horror movie mood in April. I think it's spring. I think you want fun stuff. By I then think, you're in your summer season kind right. of mood. Yeah. I mean, this is a movie that you either put out, you either put out October or you put out in January or February or like the, the, it's the, a colder winter. Month. Yeah, yeah. It is not 
a film that it's not an April film. And I think that really, there's just, nobody wants to see it and nobody's interested in seeing it. Maybe they waited for hours, wait for it to come out on, on, uh, on home video. Well, and stuff like at least that. in April, maybe it did come out in home video, like August. Maybe I couldn't find any numbers uh, in terms of how it did online or excuse me, online on, um, on DVD or Blu-ray or anything like that. Right. But I know it's popular. I know it's one of those films that if you talk to anybody, they've seen it and they like it. And I think, I think it helps that, um, you know, Hemsworth was in Thor at the time, which I'm surprised it didn't, it didn't get a huge bump. I mean, maybe this is the bump just to get like over to 70 because of him. Maybe that's why. Sure. I think also he only did the first Thor. Sure. But so still the, the yeah, he had just, right. he you're was right. just starting you're right. to blow you're up. Right. Yeah. You're right. You're right. Yeah. So I think that's part of it. I think it's just a terrible release time release day. I think it got, kept getting pushed. I think that probably, maybe they didn't, maybe Lionsgate didn't have enough money to put behind it to promote it in that, in that regard. Um, well, what do you think? Yeah, I think the release date really sucks. Um, you know, I think the pushing the release date doesn't really affect it because I don't think anybody, I, I didn't really know about that until afterward. I mean, I did know MGM was having troubles. Um, but yeah, April is just a terrible month. Chris Hemsworth is the only name, although, um, Obviously, Richard Jenkins is really, I mean, I, he's always in a lot of stuff, but I think he's really lately kind of started to do really, like, get recognized that he's very good. Um, but, like, Dana, Jules, Marty, um, Holden, Jesse Williams is in everything, but he's always that, I know that guy guy. Uh, so you don't really have any huge stars. Well, well, for, uh, the guy who played Marty, Fran Kranz, is more of a uh, writer director. Like I said, Matt, he sure. did Mass, which is pretty good. And what's funny, and uh, one more note about oh, him. I'm sorry, yeah, that he's more Jack. Yeah, than like, so the scene when they go <laughs> into the lake at the end, um, the, Marty doesn't go in, and he and he's because he he is so cut. He is in such better shape than everyone else there. They were like, it wouldn't fit his character. Yeah, that can't be the stoner yeah. guy. That's why he wears layers and doesn't go that, in the pool. With I mean, him. like the Chris Hemsworth see that. I was like, oh man, I need to do that for Thor. What do I think? And like, you know, so <laughs> I thought that was a really cool note. I was just like, oh, nice. Uh, but also like, you know, he wore baggy clothes. Like, oh, uh, of course he's going to wear baggy clothes. He's a stoner. I mean, that, that that's the look. Apparently the bong cup actually was real. $5,000. $5,000, but it actually but was real. The cup, yeah. I, mean, I was like, that's crazy. I want that, but just for more coffee. I don't need to. <laughs> just to expand. <laughs> Whoosh, more coffee. Whoosh. All right. Um, but yeah, go ahead. Continue your, 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 your point. But I think that that doesn't help. If you're going to have an April release for a horror movie, you've got to be, you know, when did the newest, not Scream 6, Scream 5, because that was the one that really kind of blew up again. When did it come out? When did that one come out? Like what month? Let's see. I'm looking it up right now. <laughs> January 14th, 2022. Okay. So yeah, that's, well, that's so when it's come out. That's winter. But that's like. But like, also, but also, Mike, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. But true. also, that's like when theaters are coming back. Like that's the kind of. You oh, know what that's I mean? true. It was a few After years, the yeah. pandemic. But like a movie like that, where it's like, we got Nev Campbell back. We got. um Oh. Monica, what the fuck? Uh, Monica, you don't know Courtney Cox? Courtney Cox. I do normally. I just blanked. Sorry, Courtney Cox. Cox. We got we got David Arquette was back. Like we got everybody back. Uh, so it's just like listen, I'm ready for Scream Seven because it's supposed to be about Neff Campbell and, and Sydney Prescott. So let's go. And she wasn't in six, right? She wasn't they in six her. because um because they didn't give her enough money. I don't think it was and they were doing the story of the other two girls, but then right. they had the the lead I uh, the no, the thing got canceled. Political stuff yeah. and she and, and she got there, the, the studio ran away from her, so they, the, you know, so now they returned to Sydney. But honestly, this is always should be a Sydney Prescott story, the entire Scream franchise. Like, I never liked them going off and doing other because I didn't because I don't care about them. I cared about Sydney Prescott and all that stuff. So I'm glad that she's back. <laughs> well, anyway, <laughs> that's uh, my Scream. For them. I think if if Scream came out in April, this this Scream, Scream Five, which was just called Scream at the time, it no, would have Scream Six was called Scream. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Whichever one I'm talking about, like, oh, Scream's coming back. All the characters are coming back that you love. Okay, that movie you can release in April because it doesn't matter. People are going to see it anyway because they want to see those characters. This is a brand new franchise with not a lot of big names other than Hemsworth, who had just started to become a name. Uh, I think that the release date really kills it. I think that the marketing probably wasn't great because it had such a low budget. You didn't really market it huge. And it's mostly, it needs to be, it's a, it's a spooky time movie. It's Spooky time movie. It, it needs to be out during spooky times. So we're completely full of crap because um, <laughs> uh, so Scream 6, it was called Scream, Scream 5. Scream 6 came out March 10th, 2023. 
Um, but Scream 4 came out April 15, 2011. But I will say but this. But again, that's the fourth one. That's no, part I of will a franchise. say Scream 4 has, is, has, Cabin in the Woods is the first of, of, it's not the Cabin in the Woods 4. So Scream 4 does have yeah. that kind of like baggage, a good baggage of the other three films. So I will say that. But yeah, we're not so full of crap. But we are. <laughs> so I think it's mostly the release date. Sure. I think that that hurts the film. I think that it's it's a weird concept. I think it's a, like I said, I haven't met anybody who hates it concept, but uh, uh, other than, A.O. Scott and his cronies. <laughs> and his cronies. <laughs> Let's get it. Do you, well, let me ask you this question, Mike. Do you think this is a movie that could be or should be remade? Oh, absolutely. I, I always think that this movie should have sequels, but just ignore that the previous one happened. You can always have the world end and you just see different concepts happen. It doesn't always have to be the cabin either. You can make it an apartment or, you know, play with other tropes of where things happen, a school or this. And the control room guys set it up and, and knock it down. and you just have different concepts, like kind of like a clue of, well, what if this happened? Mm -hmm. And I think that would be a really cool idea and you could really play with things. One of the shows I really liked on HBO, that room 113, where it was like a hotel room mm -hmm. and every episode was in that hotel room, but everyone got to play in that sandbox and make a different movie or a different show episode with different concept, different story, different characters. And I think this really lends itself to that. Cool. All right. Well, that's Cabin in the Woods. Um, thanks for listening. Uh, join us next week. We were going to be continuing on with Forgotten Horror Season 6, Fear the Darkness. Um, we're going to be talking about the 2002 film Dog Soldiers, which I had never seen. And I have never seen a trailer for it, so I have no idea what this is. Werewolves, right? Werewolves, yep. yeah. So that's next week, Dog Soldiers. Mike, anything else you want to add? Yes. Um, thank you for watching. Please like, rate, subscribe. Wherever you're watching or listening to this, all that stuff really helps the podcast grow. Uh, if you want to support us, we have a merch store on our website, and we have a Patreon. If you go on Patreon, I just talked about Alien Romulus before that came out. We did all the Alien movies, including Alien vs. Predator movies, uh, the Prometheus movies. Check that out. It's on our Patreon. We do an exclusive, at least one a month, exclusive for our Patreons, usually more, because we like to torture ourselves. Uh, you get early release access to all the episodes, access to our Discord, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it really helps the show for doing that. But just watching, liking, subscribing also really helps. Awesome. Thank you. We'll see you next week. I'm Mike Field. I'm Mike Butler. And this has been Forgotten Cinema. Wait, Forgotten Horror. Mike? Keep it spooky, y'all. I apologize. <laughs>